Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Joe Rapone, uh, who is with Sight Glass and is helping lead the world in the innovation of spectacle lenses for myopia. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Thank you for joining us for this episode today. We're joined by uh, Dr. Joe Rapone. Uh, Joe is a uh, is a genius in the world of myopia, and he's done some incredible work helping us understand the aspects of myopia, particularly in the world of spectacles. And uh, outside the United States, spectacles are far more uh, prevalent and people are more aware of them. And so we're really excited to, to learn from you. Thank you, Joe, for hanging out. Uh, it's, it's exciting to have you on the Myopia podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Joe, you, uh, you, uh, st- we were just talking about this. You started your kind of myopia career uh, a long time ago, like 13 years ago at SEBA Vision. And tell us a little bit about your journey. And you're an optometrist, right? So tell us a little bit about your background and uh, how you got to where we are today. Yeah, so I, I guess I'll go, I'll go way back. Um, sure. So in sixth grade, I remember very well, uh, a teacher um, told my parents that I was squinting to see the board. And Neither one of my parents wore glasses. My sister, my older sister didn't wear glasses. And so it was a little bit surprising for them. Um, but sure enough, I was, I was myopic and uh, getting glasses for the first time in sixth grade was this just um, incredible experience for me. I, I, I mean, I still remember it to this, to this day yeah. uh, whereby I walked out of an optical um, and saw leaves, individual leaves on a tree for what appeared to be the first time in my life. It was just this incredible experience that I'll never forget. And right there, I I said to myself, I want to help other kids see well. Um, Yes. Yeah. So that, that, you know, you hear this from optometrists a lot, but that was my, you know, eureka moment. And I realized that's what I wanted to do. And so uh, helping kids see better was why I got into optometry in the first place. But um, in, yeah, in 20, 2009, I was working in, in, in Singapore, we had a myopia program ongoing. um, And there was a lot of learning back then. And to be honest with you, I, I sort of lost a little bit of faith that we could really make a big improvement in it. Um, and in 2011 is when I started working with uh, Jay and Maureen Knights, who are the scientific mm-hmm. co-founders of Sight Class Vision. And uh, I had a great deal of skepticism. And um, my, uh, my job was to conduct a clinical trial to, to kill their idea. And I was not successful with that. Um, <laughs> and, and so that's what eventually led to sight glass vision. But yeah, it's been a long road um, in this myopia space. I, uh, I, I, I don't think it was quite 2011. I think it was a couple of years after that. But you and I had a conversation. I remember I was traveling about ready to get gas in a rental car and you and I were speaking about some of these clinical trials and it wasn't the right fit at the time, but um, you've been, you've been working on this for quite some time now. And uh, where is sight glass? What's the last couple of years looked like for sight glass? Yeah. So we, we kicked off our pivotal trial in 2018. um, And uh, we've, we've, you know, we enrolled all of the subjects in that. Uh, We had our one-year data analysis and now our two-year data analysis. And in 2022, so next year, we'll have the final 36-month analysis of that that study. Um, And so we have shifted from, you know, sort of a development organization into an organization in which we're working on uh, launching the product around the world right now. And so we were acquired by Cooper Vision, Cooper Companies um, early this year. And then they had announced in February of this year, the intention to um, 
create a joint venture with Essilor Luxottica to commercialize this product. Um, and so it's this really unique opportunity whereby we have this really great technology that's going to be commercialized by two of the giants in, in the fields, both Cooper Vision and Essilor Luxottica. Yeah, yeah. So um, have, have, has your two-year data been, uh, been published anywhere? Is, is it out there or is it still internal because you haven't uh, launched? Yeah, um, so we have, we have submitted one abstract so far. I'm working on my Arvo abstract actually mm -hmm. as we speak. And then I'll have a couple of more in 2022, um, including hopefully the three-year data being published by then. So we're working on it, but it's not fully out yet. Yeah. So uh, isn't this interesting? You know, we, we just uh, were reviewing a, a new dry eye medication and uh, their, their work was uh, they needed to show, show effectiveness over a two to four week period. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it's so, but your research has to show an effect over a two to three year experience. What has this been looking like with the, uh, with the FDA, particularly speaking from the, from the state's perspective, uh, because this isn't a product that's available, right? You're, you're, you're venturing into completely uncharted waters. Yeah. And, uh, what's that looked like from a, a trial perspective? Yeah. So, you know, the FDA is our toughest customer, uh, around the world for sure. And, um, in, I think it was September of 2016 is when they had a workshop with the American yeah. Academy of Ophthalmology, the AOA, the AAO, um, to discuss this. And really that was focused in on contact lenses, soft contact mm -hmm. lenses. Um, and so there were some ideas that came out of that uh, based on, you know, what level of, of a difference might you need to show between test and control. And I think that's where we've struggled the most with where we're pretty far ahead in the spectacle space in the U.S., and so we do have some work to do with the FDA in terms of uh, coming to a reasonable benefit risk um, for this particular product. Fortunately, they've been through this with my site and that approval. Um, and so now, you know, we're forging ahead with a, a lower risk device, which is a spectacle lens. Yeah. Yeah. And then what, what about internationally? What's, uh, what is Sight Glass looking like internationally? Um, and, and we'll get into what Sight Glass is here in a moment for people who don't know, but what, what about internationally? How's it looking? Yeah, it looks great. So we, we achieved CE mark um, sometime in, I think it was actually 20, early 2020 is when we achieved CE mark. And so we've now officially launched the product in the Netherlands. Uh, so it is, it is in the, on market there. We had a pilot uh, launch of the product in Canada as well. Yep. And so we're only at a few, a few sites in, or, or practices in Canada right now, and we're planning for a larger launch in 2022. Um, 2022, we'll have launches in uh, other markets in Europe as well, and, um, and potentially China. So we're, we're really working on this global rollout. Yeah, yeah. So let's back up. What is Sight Glass, right? So yeah. I, I think a lot of people who are listening to this particular podcast may know that, but many people are just in the contact lens space. Maybe they use atropine. What is sight glass? And, uh, and, then, and then we'll get into how does it work? Yeah. So, so sight glass vision uh, started out as a startup company um, and it came out of the technology that was developed by Jay and Maureen Knight. So it's a husband and wife research team. They work at the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, Jay is a neuroscientist and Maureen is a geneticist. And um, they, they're best well known in the color vision space um, and ended up in this myopia world um, from a very different path than, than everyone else. And uh, I guess I'm going to start with how does it work, and then I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about the product. But 
Uh, Jane Maureen essentially came up with a hypothesis that it's actually retinal contrast signaling that could be causing myopia to, to develop. Uh, and right. this was very, very different than, you know, the whole idea of myopic defocus, um, but it's actually retinal contrast signaling is what their hypothesis was based on. And so they had conducted a, um, a pilot study, a proof of concept study to evaluate the effect of reducing contrast, you know, visual contrast, the difference between black and, and white uh, would be 100% contrast and reducing that to a dark gray versus light gray would be reducing contrast, of course. And so they had evaluated that um, in a clinical study and sure enough showed that they could reduce axial length progression um, by doing that. And so since that time, the technology has been developed into what we have today, but it's all based on that idea of slightly reducing contrast while preserving visual acuity to reduce that eyes or the eyes signal for it to grow. Mm -hmm. So the, the product uh, in today's format is a spectacle lens that is composed of thousands of microscopic light scattering centers. So these are, these are these microscopic areas of the lens that just slightly scatter light and cause a little bit of diffusion um, to spread out images over the, over the retina a little bit different. And, uh, and that is all intended to reduce contrast on the, the retina, thereby reducing the signal for the eye to grow. Yeah. Yeah. Am I correct in remembering that that initial study that they did, the glasses were darker uh, for the, the study lens? And, and, and I don't know if you recall this, but I took part in that study working with them being in Seattle. It was a, a great collaboration. They're phenomenal individuals. I know they still are today. So this is a little bit different than the other products that are on the market in the spectacle world. Um which are utilizing some sort of an ad power in them, as far as I understand. Is that correct? That is correct. So the idea with myopic defocus or dual focus optical uh, technology is to introduce different planes of focus um, uh, and thereby reduce this, this idea that, you know, the eye is sensing hyperopic defocus and growing towards that plane of defocus. And so our product does not work on that at all. Um, in fact, our control lenses in our trial and our test lenses have the exact same optical profile. Um, so they don't work on that idea. They, they, the, the difference between control and test in our case is simply the addition of these light scattering centers that again, slightly reduce contrast. So it's very mm -hmm. different. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, quite phenomenal. So, um, you know, what, what, what am I going to be seeing here as we start to see spectacle lenses coming in to our practices from a myopia perspective, right? You're having to create an incredibly new category mm -hmm. for those of us who do myopia management. And what would you, what would you encourage people uh, as, as this is about to enter into the space and, and how to be thinking about this market shift? Yeah, great question. So, so first off, the nice thing about spectacle lenses is that uh, this makes this makes the practice of myopia management as simple as prescribing regular spectacle lenses. So, essentially, all an ECP needs to do now is instead of prescribing, you know, regular spectacle lenses, you you now prescribe myopia management spectacle lenses that have been shown to reduce the progression of myopia. And so it is as simple as that and thereby opens up the doors of myopia management to literally every optometrist and ophthalmologist around the world. So that's, mm -hmm. that's the really great part of spectacles. There's no behavioral change needed on the, the child's part. They have to wear spectacles already anyway to see well. The parents are used to the idea of spectacles. Um, and you know, you don't have to worry about the dexterity of the patient or the cleanliness of, of the child. 
um, because we're not dealing with a with a contact lens. And so that's the really great part of it. The, the advice that I would have though, yeah, is you you need to start immediately, right? We we cannot reverse myopia. The only thing that we can do is slow the progression of it. And this is all a game about keeping kids away from becoming highly myopic. And even even if they're not highly myopic, being able to reduce the total amount of myopia that they have. So it's, it's a progressive condition. Kids get worse as they age. This is not a wait and see thing. Is as soon as a kid is diagnosed with myopia, they should be treated immediately, and that's the that's the best way that we're going to have um, at making a big impact in this in this field. Yeah, yeah, I'm 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 really glad you you say that, and uh, you know sometimes I still am am listening to some of our myopia colleagues and they're speaking, and they talk about. Well, well, we'll try this and we'll see how much you progress, right? And uh, I think those of us who uh, who just hate myopia in any amount and progression in any amount, uh, think about this a little bit different is that, you know, a quarter of a diopter of myopia in a six-year-old, uh, that tells us that there's bad things to come. And, uh, you know, it's time to intervene right now, the moment we start to see something from a myopia perspective. A- absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And, you know, there's a couple of things that are known about myopia developments that are certainty. So number one, we know that the younger a child is, the faster they're going to progress. So the time is immediately wait and see doesn't work because they're actually going to progress fastest during that initial period of time. So, so that's number one. And then the second thing is that the younger a child develops myopia, the higher their myopia is going to be as an adult and therefore the higher risk they're going to carry of vision threatening conditions such as, you know, retinal detachment and glaucoma and most concerningly myopic maculopathy. And so, um, yeah, I I agree with you. This is not a wait and see. Uh, Let's see how someone does. This is let's get on it immediately. In fact, uh, that those early the early stage of this is probably the most important part. Absolutely. And uh, I think that statistic is somewhere around if you develop myopia in any amount before the age of seven, you're 6.6 times greater risk of developing high myopia of over six diopters or so. And so that greater risk factor just means, and you know, this is probably one of those areas where spectacle lenses will really bring a whole new arena of children into myopia where the parents are just a little hesitant in, uh, in, in a younger kid. And, uh, I personally have a little bit of a problem putting, uh, you know, a five or a six year old that I have into a soft lens because at school, they're not removing and inserting them themselves, which is why I like orthokeratology in those younger kids. But when the parents are still a little bit hesitant, spectacle lenses are certainly a good place to go. Now, as a child gets older and maybe they want to be in and they can, you know, deal with soft contact lenses, that's where I I position them. But I think spectacle lenses are going to certainly be something that is uh, really well uh, adopted by so many parents because they understand what it is. And that doesn't mean kids shouldn't still be in contact lenses, but I think it's just going to enter into our practice in a whole new way. Now, I hear a lot of myopia managers practitioners a little bit a little bit frightened about what this is going to do to their business model right and I'm sure you hear that uh, to some degree is like well am I going to still make the same amount of money as doing orthokeratology probably not uh, but how do you kind of address the the business side of myopia management because many myopia management specialists are, are listening in yeah you know um, so First of all, I think that we need multiple tools in our toolbox in order to deal with this. And, and so 
uh, in my opinion, spectacles, soft contact lenses, ortho K and atropine are all going to be part of, of that toolbox for sure. Yeah. And, uh, and different cases, different kids, different parents are going to need different things. So that that's absolutely certain. But the, the fact from a financial standpoint, if you can bring a child from just wearing regular spectacles into a non-commodity, which would be a myopia management spectacle, um, that is going to be financially beneficial to practitioners. Um, maybe even more importantly than that is on the, you know, the follow-up and management side, because um, while, while the kids are being even if they're in spectacle lenses, they still need to be followed for their myopia. And so there's the professional fee component of it as well. So simply converting your, 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 pediatric, um, your pediatric patients from a regular, see you once a year, here's your, here's your spherical regular spectacle lenses to let's manage your myopia actively with these, with these lenses, I think is going to be financially very beneficial. And as you said, there's many parents out there that aren't comfortable with the idea of ortho K or with soft contact lenses. Um, and even with the idea of putting a drop into their child's eyes for a number of years without knowing what the potential long-term repercussions of that are. So I, I think spectacles are just a really easy way of converting your patients very easily and doing the right thing for them um, from a medical standpoint. Yeah, I do think it fits into that doing the right thing. And, you know, um, when, uh, when my grandfather fit contact lenses, he, uh, he didn't charge a, a service fee at all. It was just the sale of the product. And I think many of us who do orthokeratology have felt the same way, right? We're charging for these orthokeratology lenses and, and the fitting goes into it. Or I think we're going to see the pricing of the products just be competitive out on the market, but we're going to have to go back to understanding that as specialists, we're, we're getting paid for the services that we're providing. And, uh, you know, there, there's going to be an entry to bury a barrier to entry for some people in thinking that, well, how do I bring somebody back for a spectacle lens recheck and not charge their vision insurance? And so uh, I think we're, we're, we're really going to see some business models developed and established and kind of altered, even though from the way that we've done myopia management, the spectacle lenses come into, into the States in a new way. And we can look internationally to how that's, exactly. how that's done and how they're using it. Uh, but in the States, we do things a little bit different on, on, on those side, but really you have a, have a myopia management fee and it, it doesn't matter what, what treatment you're using that, that fee is what it is. And then there's additional charges, whether you're doing myopia management with orthokeratology that you charge the patient with soft lenses, those may be more expensive with my site versus another soft multifocal and, and the spectacle lens side, then you've got your product side of things. And I think that's really the business model that we're going to see. Is that how you've kind of seen that go uh, in other places in the world, Joe? Yeah, a good, a good example is uh, our friends up north in Canada. Um, yeah you know, that's, that's precisely what most of them seem to be doing is that they have a myopia management professional fee. It doesn't matter what they use with, with the child. Um, they're, you know, typically seeing them every three months. It could be every six months though. And that additional evaluation, the additional follow-up, Part of that is axial length evaluation that they're that they're doing, and it doesn't matter if the kid's being treated with atropine or with with spectacle lenses. Um, they're evaluating their myopia and making sure that it stays in check and under control. And so, I th I think that's what we see internationally, and it makes a lot of sense to me to go about it that way in the U.S. Yeah, I agree. So I want to let you uh, go with one last question, and that is something that everybody always wants to talk about, and that is myopia management in China. Mm -hmm. So with the, uh, with the hope and the thought of, of spectacle lenses being approved in China, can you talk to us, are spectacle lenses currently in China, and how do you anticipate with your launch, hopefully, 
being done in China, how that's going to affect things. Yeah. So in China, there are uh, at least three different spectacle options available that I'm aware yeah. of. So there's the Zeiss Myovision spectacle lens. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, there is the Hoya Myosmart or Myosmart mm -hmm. uh, spectacle lens. And now there's the Essilor Stellist lens. Uh, so they're all available in China. Um, and I think they're all doing exceptionally well yeah. in China. There is a better understanding, I think, from the parents um, in terms of what this is. And, uh, you know, <laughs> most importantly, what it, what it does later in life. And, and so I think parents really, really understand it there. And so they're willing to do um, what, whatever it is they can do for their, their children uh, to, to, uh, to treat this condition. And so um, I think there's a lot more area though in China and around the world for other tools, other availability. And like I said before, we need a lot of different options. Yeah. Um, and so we're excited about introducing our product and this completely new mechanism of action around the world to help with that. Yeah, you know, in glaucoma, we have multiple drops that do, do multiple yeah. different things in multiple different ways. And uh, some patients respond better in one way than the other. And so it's it's really exciting to, to be able to have this. Joe, I, uh, I have loved seeing the progress that you have been making and the, uh, the impact you've been making on our industry. I just want to thank you on behalf of my patients and millions of patients around the world for all the hard work that you guys are doing. It takes a village to be able to make uh, this whole myopia thing, um, but uh, you're definitely beating with a pretty strong hammer and we really appreciate the progress you're making. Thanks, Dave. And, you know, I, I guess I uh, just want to say one quick thing. I saw you give a lecture a number of years ago on Simon Sinek's book on Start With Why. Yes. And it, uh, that lecture had such a profound impact oh. on me and, you know, reading the book afterwards. And uh, it really has made a big, big impact, not, not, not just on my professional life, but my personal life as well. So I, I wanted to thank you for that. You really, uh, you, you really had a big impact on my life. Oh, well, thank you. That's, uh, that's very generous of you to say. So, well, thank you, Joe. And, and, and thank you listeners for joining us for this episode of the myopia podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe so you can stay connected with additional incredible content like this message that we had with, with Joe. And uh, we'll see you again next time on the Myopia Podcast. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.